Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, proud citizens of Australian America and the primary partners in the Georgian Papers program. The Georgian Papers program aims to digitize, interpret, and make available an extraordinarily rich collection of correspondence, maps, and royal household ledgers created by the Georgian kings of England and their families. And what makes this program so great is its scope. It seeks to make available its approximately 350,000 items to the world, which promises to really change our understanding of the Georgian period, not only in England, but also in 18th and early 19th century North America. Now, part of the Omohundro Institute's contribution to this great program is to send scholars to Windsor Castle to work alongside royal archivists as they seek to gain greater insight into these rich materials. So, what exactly are these OI-funded scholars finding in the Georgian papers? Vincent Coretta, a professor of English at the University of Maryland, noted that he discovered a 1752 manuscript from an African slave trader to the president of the Board of Trade, a presentation copy of a book by an African-British author that he gave to the Prince of Wales in 1787, and the only visual representation of that same author. And thanks to the Omohundro Institute support, soon these materials will be available online as a resource to anyone in the world who wants to read and explore them. For more information about the Omohundro Institute and the Georgian Papers program, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Georgian Papers. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now... Here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 138 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Scranton and Pittsburgh. At the mention of those names, your brain probably envisioned two cities within Pennsylvania, one in the northeastern corner of the state, the other out near its western border with Ohio. But did you know in the 1760s, Connecticut claimed Scranton and Virginia Pittsburgh? That's right. Connecticut invaded Pennsylvania and claimed land in the northeastern part of that colony as its own. And Virginia also invaded Pennsylvania and claimed swaths of land in the country's western reaches as its own. All the while, the government of Pennsylvania stood powerless to stop them. Why? That's the topic for today's guest, Patrick Spiro, the librarian of the American Philosophical Society and author of Frontier Country, The Politics of War in Early Pennsylvania. Now, during our investigation of these intercolonial invasions, Pat reveals information about the founding of Pennsylvania and the form of its colonial government, early American ideas about the frontier, and how those ideas changed over the course of the 18th century, and how problems in its frontier caused Pennsylvania's colonial government to collapse by 1776. But first, Thank you so much for all your well wishes and congratulations about my new job and this podcast's new home at the Omohundro Institute. I'm wicked excited about the opportunity to work for the OI and to really contribute to its great work to support early American historical scholarship. Now, all the messages in my inbox tell me that you have one big question about my new role as the OI's digital project editor. Where am I going to live? I'm pleased to report that Boston will continue to remain my home. My partner Tim and I love living in Boston, and for me, Boston really is my home. It's the city of my birth and the one place I keep coming back to, even when I find myself living elsewhere in the country. Now, one of the many cool aspects about my new position at the Omohundro Institute is that I also get to spend more time in Virginia, working with the OI's talented staff of historians and professionals. So, Tim and I bought a townhouse in Williamsburg, so that I can spend one week per month working in the OI's office at the College of William & Mary and attending some of the fantastic events the organization hosts there. So really, I get the best of both worlds. I mean, really. Why live in one great commonwealth when I can live in two? So thanks again for all your support and well wishes. And if you have any more questions about my new job or about the Omohundro Institute, feel free to send me an email or tweet me. Okay. Are you ready to venture forth into the frontier country of early Pennsylvania? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, 
Here is this week's special guest. Our guest is the librarian of the American Philosophical Society. He's a scholar of early American history with a specialty in the revolutionary era, and he's the co-editor of the volume, The American Revolution Reborn. Today, he joins us to discuss the politics of war in early Pennsylvania with details from his book, Frontier Country, The Politics of War in Early Pennsylvania. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Patrick Spiro. Thank you, Liz, for having me. It's great to be here. And it's really great to have you here, Pat, because the frontier in politics in early Pennsylvania is really a fascinating topic. I mean, speaking of which, you start frontier country with a really provocative thought that by 1775, quote, the colony, once the literal and figurative heart of North America, the home of the largest city in the colonies and the seat of the Continental Congress that was preparing to declare 13 colonies independent of the empire had collapsed, end quote. Now, Pat, We know the American Revolution was a time of uncertainty, but the loss of Pennsylvania's governing authority sounds really dire. And I wonder if before we dive deep into the details of how Pennsylvania's colonial government collapsed, if you could provide us with an overview of the situation and what caused the Pennsylvania government to disintegrate on the eve of American independence. Yeah, that is what most surprised me about my own book. It was the discovery that in 1776, outside of Philadelphia and its surroundings, government in Pennsylvania had essentially failed. And so what you had in 1776 is in a northern third of Pennsylvania, the colony of Connecticut had staked a claim. They said that this is actually our land, not yours. And it established a government. And even though Pennsylvania had tried through a variety of means to kick Connecticut out, they lost. And then in the West, around what today is Pittsburgh, Fort Pitt, kind of the key artery to the interior of North America, Virginia had likewise said, you know what, this isn't Pennsylvania land, this is Virginia land. And Pennsylvania, again, had gone out to that area, tried to kick Virginia out, and they had lost. And then in the middle of what is today Pennsylvania, there were a series of riots and rebellions, and law had essentially ceased to exist, and the government couldn't do anything to rein in colonists to stop them from murdering Indians, harassing traders. And so when I took a picture of what we think was Pennsylvania or what today is Pennsylvania in 1776, it really was a shell of what we think of it today. Okay, so why don't we take a step back and try and figure out how Pennsylvania got to the point where its government had disintegrated in 1776. Would you tell us about the establishment of Pennsylvania? When and why did the English settle the colony? And why did they choose to settle it as a proprietary colony? Yeah, so Pennsylvania's government is a very odd government. It doesn't seem to fit into the 18th century world, which was itself kind of a liberalizing world moving towards greater democracy and government representation. And here you have in Pennsylvania, a colony that is basically owned by the Penn family. So a proprietary colony in Pennsylvania meant that the Penn family owned all of the undeveloped land and any land that had been developed or sold, the colonists owed a quit rent back to the Penn family. And so in a British empire in which most of the colonies had royal governors or were royal colonies that had a assembly and a legislature and a royally appointed governor, this was an antiquated form of government. Many people said it was more like feudalism than modern government. So the Penn family owned Pennsylvania, but the colony also had a government, which you refer to in frontier country as the frame of 1701. Would you tell us about the frame of 1701 and the type of government it provided Pennsylvania with? Sure. What's interesting about the frame of 1701 is that it's often held up as a model of a good constitution for colonial governance. Many historians have written about how democratic it was. So even though Pennsylvania was a proprietary colony, the Pens had allowed for self-government. And the frame of 1701 was actually the final one out of a series of attempts to create a government that would work in colonial America. And so what the frame of 1701 said was that every county would have equal representation and that the assembly actually had a lot of the powers of raising taxes, of funding improvements and regulating trade and other matters. How did this government function on the ground? Like, we know it's supposed to be a form of self-government. How did it actually work for the colony of Pennsylvania and its inhabitants? Was it a good government? Well, that depends on who you ask. (laughs) If you ask somebody in southeastern Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, in the immediate suburbs, they would hold up the frame of government as a great document. And that's because they have wide representation. They have a government that's very responsive to their needs. 
But as you move further and further from the seat of government, you're going to hear more and more complaints about this frame. And I think that's one of the points I try to make is that this frame of government that when you take a look at it from the Eastern perspective, it seems like a great document. But there was also a hidden flaw within it. And that's that the government, the frame of 1701, didn't have a plan or a means for incorporating new areas for expansion. Now, every one of the other attempts at government in Pennsylvania from 1682 to 1701 had a plan for how this colony, this government was going to expand. 1701 didn't. And that's where you begin to see why there was this disintegration of authority during the American Revolution or the era of the American Revolution, because these Western areas, these Northern areas, these areas further away from Philadelphia were not able to be well incorporated into this government. It bred distrust between colonists in these Western areas and the Eastern areas that ultimately led to the breakdown of authority. You know, we should really explore these Western areas of Pennsylvania for a bit. Because in frontier country, you call these areas frontier. And yet, when we think of frontier and what it is, we tend to think of a place out in the wilderness, or specifically in American history, as a place out west. So would you tell us what the frontier meant to Pennsylvanians and British Americans during the 18th century? I mean, did it also mean this place out in the wilderness or a place out west? Sure. And this was one of the kind of revelatory moments for me while I was researching the book. So I I had this problem. I had a series of observations, which was that by 1776, Pennsylvania had ceased to exist in the Western areas. You had Connecticut, you had Virginia, and then you had anarchy in the middle. And so a, a job of a historian isn't just to kind of observe what happened, but also to explain why that happened. And I was frankly struggling with figuring out why that governing authority had gone away, why Virginia was able to win, why Connecticut was able to, you know, marshal more people to settle their colony than Pennsylvania was. And I did what every historian I think should do. I just went back to the sources. I went back to the archives. And I remember the moment I was going through the papers of Edward Hand. He was the commandant of Fort Pitt during the American Revolution. I was reading microfilm at the David Library of the American Revolution. And he had some aside about the Eastern frontier. I don't even remember exactly what it was that he wrote. But at that moment, I stood up and I walked outside in this beautiful campus of the David Library. And I said, what does he mean by Eastern frontier? And that started for me an investigation into what frontier meant in the 18th century. And I started looking at dictionaries. I started looking at political pamphlets. I started rereading all the correspondence I had transcribed. And what I came across was a different understanding of frontier than I had originally had. And so in the 18th century, there's a dictionary definition published in 1776, and it defines the frontier as the border or confine that the enemy finds in the front when they're about to enter the same. So basically, a frontier in the 18th century is a zone of invasion. It is a zone that is constructed during wartime because of a fear of a potential assault. It's an area that demands government provide protection to ward off a potential invasion from an enemy. And so that made me rethink why Pennsylvania had failed in the 1760s, because what I discovered was that many of the people living in these areas were petitioning Pennsylvania saying, we are frontier inhabitants, we demand defense, greater military aid. While Pennsylvania and even the British Empire was saying, you know what, you are not a frontier anymore. You are a porous boundary between Indian country. Indians are not enemies. They are people that we want to integrate into our empire through trade and diplomatic alliances. And so my re-examination of Frontier helped me better understand that initial thing that you asked about, the failure of governing authority. Pat, you know, the 18th century definition you just found for Frontier doesn't jive at all with our present day definition of Frontier. I mean, we usually think of the Frontier with a bit of romance, as a glorious place where anyone can make a new life if they work hard enough for it. And yet, your evidence relates that, historically, the Frontier was a downright scary and dangerous place. Absolutely. I like to say that a frontier in the 18th century is a place you fled from rather than flock to. It is an area that is defined by fear, uncertainty. People don't want to be on a frontier. They want to escape a frontier. They want a frontier to close. There's a famous essay that talks about the closing of the American frontier in, in the late 19th century and how that is a major problem for the country because without an open frontier for people to settle, it's going to create all this discord. Well, in the 18th century, nobody wanted a frontier. They wanted the frontiers closed because only then could you have peace and security and stability. Okay, so let's explore the instability of colonial Pennsylvania's open frontier. Would you tell us about Kraysap's War or the Conajocular War? And 
How this war really demonstrated the limits of colonial Pennsylvania's ability to govern its frontier? Yeah, Cressaps or the Conojocular War, this is one of those stories that came alive to me in the archives. Cressaps War is a almost a decade-long conflict between Maryland, Pennsylvania, that is fought in the 1730s for control of the western half of the Susquehanna River. And I had never come across this conflict before. And I was sitting in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania where they have manuscript records from this war, just going page by page and having this event revealed to me in the reading room. And it was one of the most exciting experiences as a researcher to kind of be thrown into the midst of this war I've never heard of, trying to figure out exactly what was happening and why. And so Cressap's War is actually different from the wars Pennsylvania fought with Virginia and Connecticut. And the reason it's different is because in this war, Pennsylvania is actually able to defeat their competing colony. And so what happens is Pennsylvania basically says, we control the western side of the Susquehanna River. Everybody knows that this is the land that is fertile. It is the future of the British Empire. Maryland you know, says this is ours as well. And so they begin to have all these border clashes. They form militias. There are pitch battles. A few men die. But eventually what Pennsylvania realizes they need to do is in order to secure this territory, they need to settle it. And so up until that point, Pennsylvania had said, this will be our land, but because of Indian treaties, we will not let any settlers settle on it. So it was kind of for the future they were holding it. Maryland, however, had sent all of these colonists into this territory saying, well, if we settle it first, there's no way Pennsylvania will be able to kick us out. And so what Pennsylvania ultimately has to do to win is open up those floodgates and allow expansion into this territory. And so here you have the dilemma that Pennsylvania's government faces. On the one hand, they want to maintain stability and they want to maintain peace, especially with Native American groups who they had a long and generally good relationship with. At the same time, they realize that they need to control their future. And so in this moment, in order to secure their future, in order to secure the future of Pennsylvania's claims to this territory, they are forced to kind of undermine much of the goodwill that they had established in Native American groups and allow for kind of uninhibited expansion west. So how did this war end? Pennsylvania wins, and it's concluded with the Mason and Dixon survey. The reason the Mason and Dixon are sent to draw the line actually originates in Cressap's War, which is often not appreciated because Cressap's War essentially the fighting ends in, say, 1738. And then, of course, there's the French and Indian War. And it's not until the 1760s that Mason and Dixon are sent over. And by that point, many people have forgotten this original war that led to them being sent out to North America. And one of the most interesting finds I had in the archives was reading the journals of Charles Mason, where he visits Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And when he visits it, he runs into somebody named Samuel Smith, who was the, I think, justice of the peace or the sheriff, the sheriff during Cressap's War. And he tells Mason the whole story of Cressap's War. And Mason has never heard of it before, even though it's the reason he's there. So it's a great little story. It was one of the real pleasures to write you know, in the book. One of the interesting things that I found about the Conojocular War is that it does show the cracks or weaknesses in colonial Pennsylvania system of government. And one of the populations who certainly would have experienced and noticed the limits of colonial Pennsylvania's government first were women, because the government excluded them. But Pat, you know in frontier country that the Conojocular War actually invited the participation of women in politics. And I wonder if you would tell us more about that. Sure. Because this conflict really involved a lot of civilians, Pennsylvania at the time didn't have a formal militia. And Maryland wasn't so much as sending a militia as kind of arming their loyal settlers. And then they would create their own militias. And then there'd be these clashes between these Pennsylvanians and Marylanders. And because so much of it was about land, there were a lot of single or widowed women who saw an opportunity here if they fought with Maryland, for instance, or sided with Maryland, then Maryland would offer them land. Because really what Maryland wanted were as many people who took out legal claim to land as possible. And so in the records, there's somebody named Betty Lowe, whose husband, the Pennsylvanians had seized her husband as a prisoner of war. And so she decided to take up his guns and lead a militia during this battle. There were several widows whose husbands had died, but they decided to stay in their home and defend it against Pennsylvanians, knowing that they might be able to secure this land for their children and future generations. Likewise, in Pennsylvania, they would use occasionally women as kind of spies and go-betweens. So it was a really interesting moment where there's, because there's so much competition for settler loyalty, that's one of the most important things in all of these competitions between colonies is getting people on the ground, the colonists on the ground, 
to support one colony over the other. It really opens up a tremendous amount of opportunity for women, for new immigrants, for indentured servants who can leave Pennsylvania and side with Maryland. And Maryland say, well, now you'll be free. We'll protect you against Pennsylvania if you take up arms on our side. It's just these moments of colonial competition are just really fascinating to study. Now, for the people who lived within it, the frontier would always have a scary element to it. But by the French and Indian War, which took place between 1754 and 1763, the frontier took on a much more personal and a much more human meaning for early Americans. Pat, would you tell us how the French and Indian War altered early Americans' ideas about the frontier? Yeah, I think the Seven Years' War was probably the largest war fought in North America up to that point. And for those in the Mid-Atlantic, which is my primary area of study in Pennsylvania in particular, what I did to kind of test my thesis about the frontier and its importance to the coming of the American Revolution is to actually data mine all of the printed government records of colonial Pennsylvania. They've been printed and then they were digitized. And so I had a team of students from Williams College on a project funded by the Hellman Foundation and Williams College itself go through these records and quantify when did people talk about living on a frontier? And what is the change over time? And what we found is before 1750, almost nobody in Pennsylvania talks about living on a frontier or being a frontier person. But after 1754, when you know the French and Indian War really begins, there's a huge spike in colonists talking about, we are now a frontier. You know, People say, I have become a frontier. We are now a frontier county. And there's growth in people saying we are frontier people, as if that's a distinct identity to be a person of the frontier. And I think that that's because war for these communities had become a very personal event. Because there weren't formal militias in Pennsylvania, many of the communities in these Western areas that had been living in relative peace all of a sudden became the front lines of war and experienced war in a very personal way. And more importantly, they experienced the fear of war. So even if you didn't actually confront you know, an invasion personally, you lived in constant fear of that invasion. And I think that's one of the most transformative things to have happened in the middle colonies and one of the things that influenced the coming of the American Revolution. You just mentioned that you data mined a lot of colonial Pennsylvania's printed records to find out how early Americans were using the word frontier and thinking about frontier. Is there a digital component to your project on the web that we can maybe see the results of your work and see the changes in how early Americans thought and used frontier for ourselves? Yes. One of the big challenges with the book was that I constructed all of these maps and some of them are animated maps. And so print is static and stable. I can't put an animated map in my book. So what we decided to do is to publish all of our data online. So if you go to my website, patrickspiro.com, you'll be able to first off see the visualizations that we constructed, which includes an animated map on the use of frontier in early Pennsylvania and a data set that is not just of Pennsylvania, but of early American newspapers writ large. And you can see exactly when somebody used Frontier and where they described it. One of the other projects we did is I taught a course on the early American frontier. And throughout the course, a group of students every week would data mine early American newspapers to say, well, where in 1710 were people talking about the frontier? And then the next week, where in 1720 were they? And we went all the way up to, I think, 1850. And then we animated that map. And so you can trace out where people were actually describing as the American frontier over time. And that's one of the things I've noticed is that, you know, as historians, we've often talked about, well, here's the frontier or there's the frontier. And what I really wanted to do was say, where did people think the frontier was in their, you know, historic moment, rather than us saying as historians, this is the frontier or that's the frontier. Where did they think the frontier was? And when they said they were the frontier, what did that mean to them at that time? You know, I'd sort of like to revisit the question of what the frontier meant for people after the French and Indian War, because you note in frontier country that the French and Indian War gave the frontier a racial identity. And I wonder if you would tell us about the racial identity that early Americans saw the frontier as having. Yeah, that's one of the issues I really struggled with in my book and figuring out what I really thought about the role of frontier and also the role of race particularly kind of the racialization of Native Americans. In other words, when did colonist views of Native Americans become so vitriolic to the point where they would be treated as, you know, subhuman or, you know, outside the bounds of what we consider 
just practice in law. And what I found in Pennsylvania is that by 1763, those who thought of themselves as frontier people often viewed Native Americans as inherent enemies who did not deserve any of the protections of law. And so in the 1760s, many of the rebellions that I talked about focused on violence between whites and Native Americans, many times in which it's the colonists who are killing, massacring families of Native Americans. And then when the government tries to arrest those who committed it, communities springing up and groups springing up to protect those who committed these crimes. And so what I wanted to say is that this idea of frontier in which it's a zone of invasion against a clear enemy breeds this spread, at least in 18th century Pennsylvania, the sense that all Indians were the enemy. And because they were the enemy, they did not deserve the protections of law, which then led to the violence that we see in the 1760s. And so I think this fear of invasion morphs over time into a very, what we would say is a racialized view of Native Americans as inherent enemies. And you see this in a lot of the writing of frontier people where they say, basically, there is no Indian we can trust. They're all enemies and they all should be treated as enemies. And if you view somebody as an enemy, then they don't deserve the protections of law in a government. You know, Pat, the story you're telling us about Pennsylvania seems a bit odd because We know there was violence between Native Americans and colonists in places like New England, Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia. But Pennsylvania was established by William Penn to be a different type of colony, a colony where colonists and Native Americans were meant to live peaceably side by side. Correct. And this is the kind of the country narrative or the decline of Pennsylvania, where William Penn had tried to establish good relations with Native Americans from the very beginning. And this is what the Quaker Party that dominated the Eastern legislature wanted to continue. But what ends up happening is because this government isn't able to integrate these Western areas, they end up becoming very distrustful of this Eastern government, distrustful of Native Americans. And that's where I think that fatal flaw we were talking about earlier really comes into play because you have these people that feel so disconnected from their government, both the British Empire, but also their colonial government, that they feel that they can't trust any government and so they can only trust themselves. And they begin to act in these very, very violent ways, in ways that kind of contravene and contradict the government's attempt to maintain peace. I wonder if you would tell us more about one of these really violent ways that colonists impacted and inhibited the Pennsylvania government's ability to keep peace. Would you tell us about the Paxton Boys Conestoga Massacre in 1763 and why you think this massacre demonstrates the politics of the frontier? So the Paxton Boys Rebellion is that moment where I first started to see in writing that idea that all Native Americans were enemies. And this is the Paxton Boys in a nutshell. It is probably the largest colonial political protest movement, certainly in Pennsylvania history and maybe in North America up until that point. And what happens is a Native American community living outside of Lancaster, Pennsylvania called the Conestoga. The Conestoga had signed a treaty with William Penn. They had a reserve piece of land that they lived on. They had declared their neutrality, but a group coming from Paxton, Pennsylvania, which was kind of a dispersed community of Scots-Irish farmers and others said, you know what? We suspect they're the enemy because we can't trust any Native American group. And so they raid that community. They kill the elderly, women, children. There are a few survivors that the Pennsylvania government then takes and puts into the Lancaster County Jail, thinking that it's the safest place. And an even larger group mobilizes, raids that jail, and massacres the survivors, those who had survived that initial raid, and essentially exterminate the entire group. Then an even larger group mobilizes and says, you know what, we need to now march into Philadelphia and lay before the government the reason why we did this and to try and get them to remove all Native American groups from the colony, because that's the only way we can feel safe. And so there's hundreds of people marching from York County, Cumberland County, Lancaster County, these Western areas to Philadelphia, over 90 miles in the middle of the winter. They settle in Germantown, Pennsylvania, at which point Benjamin Franklin and a delegation walk out to say, what are you guys thinking? You can't invade Philadelphia. Are you trying to cause a civil war? In the meantime, the British army and a bunch of Philadelphians are all taking to arms, prepared to protect the city from a potential invasion. And so the Paxton boys lay before the government a list of grievances. And these grievances really lay down what I call is the kind of frontier political culture, the idea that they need more defense, that the government ignores their complaints, and also that they need equal representation. And this is getting at that fatal flaw of 1701. They say, you know, the eastern counties all get about 26 representatives. The rest of us, who are probably half the colonial population, only get 10 representatives. 
So there's also this, you know, concern about representation in government, which of course has, you know, resonance with the other debates that are happening in the empire about colonial representation in parliament. So it's a really, really, for me, this was the entryway into this entire book, this massacre, but then this political movement that produced all these documents and arguments about what a good government should be. It seems so disconnected from the Stamp Act or the towns and duties and really dealt with issues of the West. And it's a very different crisis of governing, a very different crisis for the British Empire, but one that I think is just as important for understanding the coming of the American Revolution. You know, as you were describing the Paxton Boys Rebellion, it occurred to me that the rebellion really does open a wide window onto early America, because as you were discussing the frontier and how Pennsylvanians came to fear it, it sounds like Native Americans must have also come to fear the frontier too. I mean, they must have been looking east and all around them at these white settlers with a lot of uncertainty and fear. Absolutely. And you have a whole cohort of officials, both colonial officials and imperial officials, who are trying to maintain peace and diplomatic partnerships with Native American groups. And they're saying what these colonists are doing are not the sentiments of the British Empire. Yet there's nothing the colonial government, who's the body tasked with bringing these people to do justice, the people that commit murders and massacres. And so they go, you know, unarrested. And Native Americans are looking at the British Empire and saying, well, you have to do something about this and you can't. And so this is kind of the dilemma. The crisis of empire on the frontiers has to do with how the British Empire can control its colonists, how it can maintain the terms of peace that they've created with Native American groups. So this is one of the biggest dilemmas for the empire is how do you transition from wartime to peace on frontiers? Now, as Pennsylvania was trying to keep peace in its frontier regions and convince its frontier inhabitants and Native American allies that it really could protect them, some of the other colonies saw an opening to prey on Pennsylvania's lands. Pat, would you tell us about Connecticut and Virginia's attempts to claim and secure land in Pennsylvania? Yeah, it's very odd to imagine that Connecticut could even say this northern part of Pennsylvania, you know, we've got New York in between us, is ours. And not only that they say it, that they settle it. And not only that they settle it, but they actually set up a government there and control it. And the same for Virginia. And so the arguments basically go back to their charters, to how to interpret charters, what they meant. So Connecticut says our original charter says that this land should be ours all the way to the West. And yes, I know New York's now in the way, but still New York's established, but the rest of our claim stands. And so as land in Connecticut dried up and you know those in New England could produce prodigiously, they had large families and they needed their second, third, and fourth sons to have you know opportunity. And so they started to spot this area of Pennsylvania and say, you know what, maybe this should be ours. And so they're able to secure purchases through what are probably very illegal and dubious Native American sales to representatives of Connecticut. And so they begin to settle that land in the 1760s. Virginia's is a slightly different story. There, they basically say three things. First, they say, we think our charter says this should be ours. Second, during the Seven Years' War, this territory was conquered by the French and then reverted back to the British. And because it went back to the British, it goes to the crown. And because Pennsylvania is a proprietary colony and Virginia is a crown colony, it should actually go to Virginia. And so in the 1770s, you have Virginia basically saying all of this land around Pittsburgh is actually now Virginia territory. So what did the government and people of Pennsylvania make of all of these land grabs within their colony? Did they refute or resist them in any way? Well, they tried, but they failed. So what had happening in, in both of these situations was Virginia and Connecticut would send delegations of people out to settle the land. And then they'd also try and convince either new colonists to come into these territories or those that already lived in there to swear allegiance to their colony, either Virginia or Connecticut. And so in the case of, say, Virginia, Lord Dunmore, who is the governor of Virginia, sent out his agent, John Connolly, to Fort Pitt, where he started doling out land, giving out militia positions. And of course, he also had a lot of rum. And there's a great story in which he shows up at Fort Pitt with a barrel of rum and starts doling out rum and Pennsylvania and observes that was a very good inducement for people to join Virginia. So Pennsylvania, they would send out their own representatives around Fort Pitt. They sent Arthur St. Clair. St. Clair had been a British military officer during the Seven Years' War. He decided to stay in Pennsylvania and he was now kind of the agent of the proprietors who wanted Fort Pitt to be their land. And what you had happening was St. Clair would give speeches. We have records of the speeches he delivered to a large audience in, at Fort Pitt 
and talk about why people should join Pennsylvania and not Virginia. And then he had all these other delegates going out into homes and saying, you should really be a Pennsylvania, not a Virginian. It really was like campaigning. You had Virginia offering their vision of government, their vision of the West, Pennsylvania offering their arguments, and really colonists in the middle got to decide. And so, you know, Pennsylvania tried to convince people that Pennsylvania was a better colony, but they lost. And they lost, I argue, around Fort Pitt because Virginia embraced the values of the frontier political culture. They declared the Shawnees enemies and launched a war against the Shawnees. They created militias while Pennsylvania was sitting there saying, we don't have a militia and that should be a good thing, not a bad thing, because that's a sign that Pennsylvania privileges peace. They want trade and with trade comes prosperity. And, you know, the colonists on the ground were saying, we are frontier people. We want to side with Virginia. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Colonies were invading each other. What did the British government think about Pennsylvania being invaded from Connecticut and Virginia? I mean, did they intercede to stop it? Well, this is another piece of that imperial crisis on the frontiers of North America. There were, in the era of the American Revolution, border conflicts stretching from really New Hampshire all the way down to Virginia. Massachusetts and New York debated where their boundaries met. Massachusetts wanted to the Hudson River. New York said no way. New Hampshire and New York both claim Vermont as their own. You have Connecticut claiming Pennsylvania, Virginia claiming Fort Pitt. So the borders of these colonies were a real mess. And the empire was aware of it, but they didn't really have a means to kind of adjudicate these disputes. It wasn't a clear path to solving these problems. And so that's one of the things to note in the Articles of Confederation. One of the longest parts of that document, the early governing document for the new nation, is how to mediate disputes between states. And I think that's a direct result of the failure of empire in the 1760s that all the colonists were aware of and saying, we really need a clear way to resolve these issues. And in the Articles of Confederation, especially in John Dickinson's draft of it, there's a whole heck of a lot of information about Western lands and what to do with them. So do you think that these incursions by colonies into other colonies and Western lands in general played a big role in fomenting the American Revolution? That's a tough question to answer. Did it foment the American Revolution? In other words, did these border conflicts lead to American independence through the Declaration of Independence? And I think what happened was that there were kind of two separate crises of empire happening in the 1760s. There's the one that we know very well, Stamp Act, the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, the Sons of Liberty in the East. And they were debating representation with parliament. They were talking about regulations, where authority rested on these issues. And then you have the frontier areas, especially in Western Pennsylvania, the middle colonies, a very different dispute going on. It was, are we a frontier or not? And if we are a frontier, we expect our government to do certain things for us. And when they didn't, that led to similar rebellions and riots. And eventually these conflicts between colonies became the means by which frontier people were able to create their own government. So they were in some ways creating new governments, governments that fit their needs right on the verge of American independence as well. But it was caused by you know very different reasons. When we started our conversation, we noted how Philadelphia was the place where the Continental Congress was getting ready to declare 13 colonies as a new and independent nation, and how at the same time, it was also the seat of a colonial government that had basically collapsed. Did independence allow Pennsylvania a redo, a chance to regroup, reclaim, and maybe reorganize its frontier country and government? I think that's one of the most remarkable things to have happened in Pennsylvania during the revolution. I like to say the most revolutionary thing to happen in Pennsylvania was the creation of the state itself. Because in 1776, the state as we know it today did not exist, even though the colonial government claimed that that was their domain. Virginia was in the West, anarchy in the middle, Connecticut in the North. And so by the end of the American Revolution, Pennsylvania controls all these areas that previously did not. And how that happens is that the revolutionary government becomes a frontier government. Representation in the revolutionary government is equally weighted. So all of a sudden, the frontier now has a majority of the legislature, and they begin enacting all of the things that they had been asking for throughout the 1760s, which then leads colonists in these areas, especially around Fort Pitt, to start to renounce their former allegiance to Virginia and begin to join Pennsylvania. 
And Virginia, in the meantime, is acting more like Pennsylvania, where they're saying, we actually want to maintain peace and stability in our Western areas and instead focus on fighting the British in the East. And so the most revolutionary thing to have happened in Pennsylvania was this change in policy that it ended up creating the government in the state that we know today. And your response to that question is a perfect segue into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if the colonies had either not pursued independence or not pursued it for another 20 years or so? What would have happened to Pennsylvania's ability to function as a colony if independence had been delayed or not come? That is a really interesting question because in 1776, Virginia's courts are operating around Fort Pitt. That whole western third of the state today is clearly in Virginia hands. We have the court records from the county that operated there. The same for Connecticut. And Virginia's hold would have only gotten stronger in that area. Connecticut's hold would only have gotten stronger in that area. And I think one of the other reasons Pennsylvania is able to secure this territory is that these border conflicts were happening in 1772, 1773. So it was really easy to kind of unwind Connecticut and Virginia in these areas. But if you talked about another 20 years in which these colonies become entrenched, their government, the settlers become you know, loyal to Virginia, that would have been a very difficult thing to undo. And we might be thinking about you know, Pittsburgh, Virginia, and Scranton, Connecticut today. And if you think about the history of Pennsylvania, you know, Pittsburgh was, you know, central to the development of Pennsylvania in the 19th century and 20th century. It would have been a remarkably different world. So, Pat, are you staying in the Pennsylvania frontier for your next project or are you researching a different topic? Yes, I've actually just finished a book on the Black Boys Rebellion, which is a rebellion that happened in 1765. It's one of these frontier rebellions that I was able to talk about for only a few paragraphs in my book, but it was one of the most remarkable and largely unknown events that I came across in my research. And in 1765, there's a peace treaty that's supposed to happen at Fort Pitt. The diplomat out there has sent one of the largest pack trains of goods ever assembled. We estimate that there's enough shirts to clothe half the Native American population in Indian country at the time. And a group of frontiersmen dress like Indians, they blacken their faces, and they destroy this pack train of goods as it's heading west to Fort Pitt for this peace treaty. It's a incredible destruction of King's property. They then lay siege to a British fort twice. They seize the commandant. They threaten to cart him off to North Carolina. And then they create their own inspection regime. So every person traveling on the road is liable to inspection. And for me, this gets at that imperial crisis we've been talking about in this one remarkable story that I was able to kind of piece together in a narrative and short book. So uh, I've just completed that. And then I think for my next project, I'm going to try and head back east to Philadelphia during the American Revolution. And I'm not quite sure what I'm going to find or what I'm going to do, but I want to come back east and see how everything looks from this perspective. And where should we look for more information about you and how we can contact you if we have questions about early Pennsylvania and the frontier in early America? Yeah, I've created a website, patrickspiro.com, to supplement the work of the book. You can find additional research that didn't make it into the book, customized maps that I created that I couldn't include in the book, all on my website, patrickspiro.com. Now, Pat, I know we need to have you back on the show at some point to talk about the American Philosophical Society, which has a huge connection with Benjamin Franklin. But in the meantime, does the APS have any exhibits or events coming up that might be of interest to us? Yeah, there's two things going on. First, we're about to launch a new exhibit called Curious Revolutionaries, the Peels of Philadelphia. The APS library has the papers of Charles Wilson Peel and his family and his descendants. And so this is an exhibit that's going to be open from April to December that explores the lives and legacies of this really remarkable family. And then in October, we're going to be hosting a major international conference called The Art of Revolutions. And it's a look at the art that was produced during and after the Great Atlantic Revolutions, the American Revolution, the revolutions that were happening in Haiti and the Caribbean and Latin America, and of course, the French Revolution and even the revolutions of 1848. So it's going to be a very, you know, we were hoping it's going to be geographically broad and chronologically very deep and hope to get, you know, some really interesting conversations 
that usually don't happen. Thank you so much for joining us, Patrick Spiro, and for taking us through the early history of Pennsylvania and the frontier in early America. Thank you. This has been great. By 1775-1776, the colonial government of Pennsylvania had largely collapsed outside of the city of Philadelphia. Connecticut invaded and claimed large swaths of the colony's northeastern lands, and Virginia invaded and claimed large swaths of its western lands. All the while, the government of Pennsylvania stood powerless to stop them. But why did this happen? As Pat noted, the primary job of a historian is not only to find out what happened, but to explain why it happened. To understand the why, we historians go to the archives and look at historical sources. And this is exactly what Pat did to figure out why Connecticut and Virginia were able to successfully invade and hold parts of colonial Pennsylvania. And what he found were two causes. First, the frame of 1701, the constitution of colonial Pennsylvania, if you will, had a major flaw. It had no provision or method for admitting new settlements to the colony's government. Therefore, Western inhabitants were underrepresented in the colonial assembly and underserved, or at least that's how they felt, by the Pennsylvania government. The second cause was changing early American attitudes about the frontier. As Pat related, early Americans understood the frontier as a zone of invasion, a region the enemy could easily invade during war. Fear about such invasions, especially after the long and violent French and Indian War, caused many Western Pennsylvanians to look around them and fear attack by Native Americans or some other unknown enemy. These frontier inhabitants beseeched the government of Pennsylvania for help. But Eastern settlers told them that they had nothing to fear and easily voted down requisitions or requests for aid in the colonial assembly. Seeing an opportunity, Connecticut and Virginia stepped in. They sent settlers, militia units, and established local governments in frontier areas that promised these Western Pennsylvanians the assistance they sought, armed protection against Indians and unknown enemies. This is why Pennsylvania lost control of its territory and its government collapsed. But as Pat revealed, fortunately for Pennsylvania, the American Revolution and its war for independence hit a figurative reset button for the colony. As Pennsylvanians crafted a new government for their state, they were able to address the problems that had plagued them as a colony. They were able to create a government that could service its frontier regions. Look for more information about Pat, his book, Frontier Country, plus information about the American Philosophical Society and links to Pat's digital maps on the show notes page benfranklinsworld.com slash 138. The Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture made today's episode possible. In fact, the OI makes lots of things possible in the world of early American history because they support such a vast range of publications and programs. Programs like the Georgian Papers program. To learn more about the Omohundro Institute and to investigate the papers of the Georgian monarchs and their families for yourself, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Georgian Papers. Do you know of other instances of colonies invading other colonies? Pat told us all about how Maryland, Connecticut, and Virginia invaded Pennsylvania, and he mentioned how Massachusetts and New Hampshire invaded New York. And I'd love to know if you know of more cases of intercolonial invasion. So if you do, send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.